Okay, Noam Chomsky, thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to start by asking, how are you and how's everything where you are? Okay. Yeah, everything's okay and, 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 and you're all right. Yeah, good. Um, honestly, we are just so, so grateful that you are uh, giving this interview to the People's Assembly. Um, and I think it's fair to say that you're a legend, that you've contributed so much to our collective knowledge and understanding of the world. And for that, we thank you. And I want to start off by asking you what, what brought you to have a thirst for, for more knowledge and particularly for political activism? It was almost 90 years ago, so watching uh, people coming to the door, uh, trying to sell rags, uh, starving, uh, seeing uh, women uh, picketing outside a textile plant and being beaten by security forces. Uh, this is the early 30s. You couldn't help becoming politically engaged. Uh, my whole family was working class immigrants, uh, mostly unemployed. It was just everywhere around you. And it's never, never stopped since. Mm. And it obviously really shaped your consciousness. And I just, I just, I suppose we can't not start by thinking about coronavirus and, and the pandemic and its relationship to capitalism. Do you think this could be, this moment in time could be the catalyst for fundamental change? It could be, but we have to start by recognizing exactly what you said. What is the relation of the pandemic to capitalism? I don't read all the British press, but it's never discussed here. Uh, I can't find a word about it. Uh, but if we want to stop, if we want to understand what happened, that's the question we have to ask. Now, furthermore, it's a very practical question because there's another pandemic very likely coming, probably more severe than this one because of the effects of global warming. And uh, scientists are telling us exactly what they told us in 2003, after the SARS epidemic, that we have to prepare right now. Uh, what, and they know what to do, basically, pretty much. But somebody has to do it. Who can do it? Well, one possibility is the drug companies. They are bloated with profits uh, thanks to the neoliberal globalization that they've designed, which gives them extraordinary patent rights, monopoly uh, pricing rights. So they got money coming out of their ears. They have all the labs and so on, but there's a barrier, exactly what you said, capitalism. Mm. It's not profitable to prepare for a disaster a couple of years down the road. That's not the way you make money. So they're out. Uh, there's another possibility, the government. The government does, and it does most of the research. The public funds are used for most of the research that creates uh, vaccines and drugs. The, the basic research and development is done in government labs, in research institutions, research universities. It's handed over to the drug companies for adaptation to the market and profits. That's what we call a free market. So the government has the resources and the capacities to do it. But then there's another barrier. It's called Reagan and Thatcher, mm -hmm. neoliberalism. The government is the problem, not the solution. Reagan's little speech when he was inaugurated. Uh, Thatcher echoed it in her own words. That inaugurates the 40 years of neoliberalism uh, intensified in England by austerity on the continent. Uh, disaster for most of the population. Uh, great for the tiny sector that enriched themselves. Uh, but what it really means is when you say government is the problem, it means decisions and choices of action have to be taken away from the government, which is at least to some extent responsive to the population. And it has to be placed in the hands of completely unaccountable private 
tyrannies. Uh, that's what it means. So, okay, given the savage form of capitalism called neoliberalism, mm -hmm. the government is out. So that's two main, these are the two main ways of dealing with the problem, both board. Uh, then after that comes the reactions of particular governments and leaders. And that has varied. So for example, when, when the pandemic struck, uh, December, there were, China began reporting uh, uh, unexplained pneumonia-like symptoms it was distributed by the World Health Organization. Uh, within about 10 days, uh, China, Chinese scientists had identified the virus, the source, had sequenced the genome, had provided the information to the World Health Organization, the entire world. At that point comes the question how governments respond. Well, there are governments who care enough about their population, so they responded right away. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, uh, they have the situation pretty much in hand. Others waited. Europe didn't pay much attention at first to these Asians. Finally, they got started in various ways. Europe, uh, more or less, uh, in different ways, reacted, some of them pretty successfully. Uh, Britain was a wreck. You know what happened, I'll tell you. At the absolute bottom of the barrel was the United States. It was impossible for health officials, uh, intelligence to break through the, get to the White House, to get the sociopath in charge to pay attention. Now he's blaming everybody in sight. Uh, this morning, he blamed his intelligence briefer. He said she didn't tell him. Of course, she told him. Uh, let's blame China. Let's blame the World Health Organization. Find somebody to cover up for the crimes. Uh, he's responsible for killing tens of thousands of Americans. Can't let that be on the record. Uh, other governments reacted differently. It's, uh, uh, I should say that if you look back a couple of years, uh, things were happening in the years before the pandemic struck. So the Obama administration actually did make some efforts to try to deal with things. The Obama administration was a science-oriented administration. A lot of scientists who constantly consulted and they, they actually developed a pretty extensive uh, uh, system for reacting quickly if a, if a pandemic struck, which was anticipated. Mm -hmm. The first thing Trump did when he came to office, within days, literally, was dismantle the entire system. Got to get rid of it. Uh, it doesn't bring profit to my friends. We don't want it. Uh, then he started, uh, there were programs, new government programs with US scientists working to try to identify other coronaviruses. They were working in China, which is one of the main sources, with Chinese scientists. These were disbanded. Uh, he began to defund the Center for Disease Control, very similar to what's been happening in England with uh, trying to turn the best health service in the world into a model of the worst health service in the world. That's England. The United States, same thing. The, uh, uh, every year of his administration, he defunded the Center for Disease Control and other health-related institutions. Meanwhile, handing out lavish gifts to his rich supporters. Uh, the, the tax cut is just a main legislative achievement, just a giveaway to the corporate sector and the rich. Actually, that's happening right now with the bailout when you look at it. Uh, in any event, the United States, I should say also that under neoliberal programs, the uh, health system, which is already a, an international scandal, uh, pretty much the only country without any kind of national health care. But it was uh, the neoliberal requirement is that you impose a business model. 
that means no extra beds in the hospital, just just on time, just like you run an auto plan, uh, which more or less works in normal times, not wonderfully as many can attest, including me, but at least it sort of works. Anything goes wrong, it collapses. If the assembly line collapses on a motor plant, okay, you wait a while and you fix it, but you can't fix this, it's gone. So everything collapsed. You see these heroic doctors and nurses working overtime in, uh, in hospitals without equipment, without protection, uh, mm. uh, nothing's there because there was no spare capacity. And a sociopath running the place who says one thing one day, one thing the next day. And in fact, is acting to make it worse. Very clearly, we could go into that. But anyway, that's uh, that's what happens when you have real uh, significant uh, business model imposed. Then it's a recipe for disaster. This was exaggerated during the neoliberal period, but actually goes back before. So that's where we are now. Mm. The uh, uh, current, uh, we will, one or one way or another, recover from the pandemic. It'll be a terrible cost, a much greater cost than it has to be, but we'll, there will be recovery. Mm -hmm. Then comes the question of what kind of world comes out of it. Well, there are groups working very hard, relentlessly, to ensure that what comes out of it is a replica of what caused it under a harsher, more authoritarian regime. So if you take a look at the President Trump's uh, executive orders, they're worth reading. Now take a look at the small print. Uh, it's not very deeply hidden. Uh, calling for deregulating everything. It makes it look as if it's just because of the crisis. You read closely, it's not. It says that we have to use the opportunity to make the deregulation permanent, to get rid of any uh, constraints on the business world by the uh, by governmental authority, uh, to ensure that businesses have no liability. So if a business forces its workers back to work, say in a meatpacking plant where it's very dangerous, mostly Puerto Rican and black, you know, who cares? Uh, if they uh, get a virus because, or if there's not health conditions established, they don't have any liability. That's very important. It's one of the main issues behind the holding up the stimulus bills. And all of this is to be made per permanent. It goes on. The fuel, the fossil fuel companies are there begging for increases in subsidies. It's all granted. Now, this is a way to design. And meanwhile, the surveillance that's being introduced is pretty interesting to look at. So people are working at home. Well, the bosses don't like that. They can't watch them every minute. So there, there's new software being developed, which enables the boss to monitor your, your computer screen and check your uh, keyboard. So if you go off into the kitchen and get a cup of coffee, they know and you quickly get a demerit. Uh, you've got to maintain tight control over the workforce. There are slaves. They don't have any freedom. And if they're working at home, we have to extend it to home. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's nothing particularly new about this. It's just an enhancement of what's been going on throughout the Industrial Revolution, back to Taylorism. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is extending. And this technology can be permanent. It can be ways in which your home is under surveillance. Surveillance means control. Uh, that's been going on anyway. If you're working in an Amazon warehouse, for example, you're tightly monitored. And there's designated paths that you have to go when you're racing from one spot to another. If you get off the path, you get a warning, an instant warning, demerits, you're in trouble. Uh, suppose you're um, driving a delivery truck for United Parcel Service. They've worked out electronics, which means they can monitor everything the driver's doing. If the driver, say, 
stops for a cup of coffee, demerit. If he backs up when he wasn't supposed to back up, demerit. Mm, and you see, I don't, I don't know if you see the delivery drivers where you are, but I see them from my window and they look intensely stressed and pressurised and um, it is uh, a theme of the modern uh, way of work. They're so atomised and their, their rights, their relationship to the employer is so, is so broken. I, I, want, I want to, because you've just described their so eloquently how the capitalist system uh, intensifies and um, exacerbates uh, this this coronavirus and what comes next is really up to two forces uh, and the forces of those that you describe want to replicate what has already been and all of those millions upon millions of people who are desperate for change and and you quite rightly said we don't ever really in the mainstream talk about the virus within the context of capitalism we have government daily briefings i don't know if you've seen them but they're very stage managed they are very very tight uh, they are uh, very often alternative realities to people's daily existence and and so in one sense this whole scenarios lifting the lid on and exposing the the kind of the ravages of capitalism if you like and i wonder if there will be a connection by many many more people between their experience and the system that depends on people like you it's a little <laughs> bit like knowing how to deal with a crisis but nobody picking up the ball and running with it. Yes, we now have very clear evidence about the catastrophic features of capitalism, particularly in the unregulated Reagan-Thatcher form, Blair-style new labor form, austerity form. No, this is what it leads to. The information's there. It's not profound. No, it's right on the surface as soon as you look at it but somebody has to use the information somebody has to reach the public with what you're not seeing in the headlines i doubt that there are many headlines in england saying uh, this is the capitalist crisis here's the reasons well okay it's the job of activists to do it to reach the public with it i mean you can't expect people who are trying to get by to the next paycheck to work all of this out. But activists can do it. And I think it's a time when there could be major challenges to a system of oppression, which is very deep seated, all the way back to the nature of capitalism has gotten much worse during the neoliberal austerity period. Uh, it's, it leaves people angry, uh, resentful, uh, mm. bitter, uh, hating institutions. It's fertile territory for demagogues. We've seen that. You can blame somebody else, you know, the immigrants, the Chinese, uh, somebody out there, and not the people who are responsible. We don't blame them and the institutions that are responsible. But that's the job of activists. Can be done. That's, mm. I think a lot of things are happening. And it's interesting that you talk about the blame game, Noam, because right now, you probably know this, but the British Parliament is passing an immigration bill in the middle of this crisis. I mean, the, the bill was in the pipeline, but in the middle of the crisis, it has re-emerged conversations about who should get access to the NHS. It's a diversion, in my view. Can I just quote something you've said before and, and ask you a bit, a bit more about it? You said, it is rather striking to observe that the policies that the rich and powerful adopt for themselves are precisely the opposite of those they dictate for the weak and poor. I, I just want to know what you think the most striking example of that is that you have observed in the system. Take a look at the United States today. Uh, 0 0.1, not 1. 0.1% of the population have about 20% uh, of the country's wealth. 
uh, half the population has negative net worth liabilities greater than assets an estimated roughly 70 percent of the population are living from paycheck to paycheck uh, that's if they're lucky enough to have a job there's been a vast increase in the what's called sometimes the precariat people with precarious employment uh, you're sitting there waiting on the phone and your boss says you got to come in tonight and work for eight hours okay maybe you go uh, the uh, benefit system has which was pretty awful in the first place one of the worst in the oecd severely declined now, the efforts now are to make it worse uh, meanwhile other people are doing great so during the pandemic uh, private equity firms and uh, hedge funds have seen their profits soar now, their uh, private equity firms are using the pandemic to buy up the medical facilities which are cheap now uh, and particularly the ones that are non-essential so they're going after dermatology you know botox treatments or wrinkles on your face and so on and uh, buying up the paying off the doctors some agree and become employees and then pressing for special rights to uh, use those uh, so let's get people to come in for uh, you know getting their wrinkles fixed and so on i mean well breaking all the rules and they're just their profits are going through the roof but there's another one that's not talked about much but you've both in england and the united states uh, nursing homes have been one of the worst uh, uh, most suffering of all uh, i know the u.s situation better so i'll describe that i'm sure it's the same in england the same. but most of them been bought up by private institutions uh, big wealthy funds equity funds and so on and they're being treated like any business that you're trying to destroy uh, cut it down to the limit you know no uh, no equipment no no nurses and so on uh, meanwhile profits are doing great uh, they are the association of uh, nursing home owners very wealthy one of trump's main funders so he appears with them in uh you know uh, public events where he praises them for their wonderful things they're doing to pour more money into his pocket i mean well people are dying okay they're dispensable who needs them it's kind of a, just uh le yesterday uh azar the head of the health system uh, was asked in a press conference uh, why the death rate in the united states is so high is it a is it a problem that the government didn't do something properly he said no the problem is he said we have an unhealthy society blacks and hispanics are unhealthy they're living in cities they're too obese they, we can't do anything about that the government can't help the fact that we have this unhealthy segment of the society the people aren't pure white okay that's from the top executive okay what do you think that effect that has on people who are listening people out in the rural areas who say yeah we don't want these people anyway they're an infection it's not sure that's how trump builds up his voting base I understand the republicans have a serious problem they've had it ever since reagan back to nixon they're of the two the united states is basically a one-party state as a business party two factions one faction is more committed to the rich the powerful the corporate sector than the other one is become much more so in recent years well you can't go to voters and say i'm trying to screw you please vote for me so what you have to do is turn to what are called cultural issues uh it's uh, gun rights uh, uh, abortion uh, foreigners uh, blacks uh, you know something or other so you have to create a voting base uh of uh, on the basis of these kinds of issues and when you have a, a, a basically a sociopathic racist in charge with his words being echoed 
on the Murdoch uh, network, Fox News network, which most Republicans listen to, has an impact. Now that's why you have uh, uh, attitudes which are uh, driving the United States off the international spectrum. And the pandemic is bad enough, but there's things that are worse. Uh, we'll, we will recover from the pandemic. Mm-hmm. We're not going to recover from the melting of the polar ice sheets, uh, the uh, increasing uh, heating, which is going to make much of the uh, world uninhabitable in uh, 50 or 60 years. We're not going to recover from that. Well, you can't do anything about that unless people know it's happening. Exactly. You take a look at Republicans, the majority don't see any problem. They hear from the president, from the party leaders, from Fox News, it's all a liberal hoax. Uh, I don't see the, you know, I don't, I don't see it happening, so it's not happening. If that continues, we're basically finished. Mm-hmm. There isn't a lot of time to deal with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you saw, uh, you, you'll, have, you'll have known in December, we had a general election. Uh, I was one of the victims of that general election. I lost my parliamentary seat. But irrespective of, uh, irrespective of that, uh, there was lots of cultural issues that were stoked up. So it was a, a kind of Brexit election, but very often it was about power. You know, the Conservative Party talked about power and control and about bringing back power to, to people, but had none of the policies to actually liberate anyone. Uh, you know, and conversely, there were very, very progressive industrial relations policies developed by what was the opposition party, the Labour Party at the time, around workers having the capacity to negotiate their own terms and conditions and a whole raft of other things. But of course, uh, didn't chime, I suppose, or was not as powerful as some of the, the kind of tactics of division and the imagery of taking back control. Although we now know that we're moving into a period where people are ultimately completely out of control in this in this crisis their exposure to the virus is completely dependent on the state on their employment relationship uh, and and what kind of what kind of money that they they have no i just i just want to move us on because we are a grassroots organization and people were kind of blown away that we were going to be talking to you. So they sent in questions. I'm just going to put a couple of those questions now, if that's okay, from the people that are a part of and are activists with the People's Assembly. So one person asked, why do you think socialism remains on the fringes of politics at a time when capitalism is failing people so regularly? Well... The uh, uh, one reason is that people are basically unrepresented. Uh, If you look at people's attitudes, uh, they tend to be pretty progressive. So take, say, what happened in 2017 in England, uh, the Labour Party with a pretty progressive program, what an extraordinary victory. Uh, If you take a look at, uh, say, YouGov polls, people had pretty much the same attitudes in 2019. The attitudes are there, not the willingness to vote for the people, for the party that was supporting them. Well, there's a gap there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about England. You know much more than I do. But take the United States. Uh, The Sanders program, which is basically the counterpart, Uh, is called socialist. It's considered radical. But just take a close look at what's happening. You read the mainstream press, uh, which has kind of left liberal columnists, uh, good ones. Uh, They'll tell you, they write, we like Sanders' programs, but the country's just not ready for it. It's too radical for the country. Then ask yourself, what are the programs? Well, two major programs. One is universal health care. Have you heard of a country that has universal health care? Can you think of one that doesn't have it? It's pretty hard, but the American people aren't ready for that. The other is 
free higher education. Well, take a look at the continent. Almost every country has free higher education. Uh, take a look at poor countries like Mexico next door, free higher education. So what these columnists are saying, the left columnists about the United States is, this country is so backwards it can't join the world. Uh, well, that's it's an attitude, you know, but it's, if you ask, take a look at what people really want, they say, yeah, we do want that, let's have it. Uh, but if you're not represented, you're not going to get it. Now there are careful studies in the United States by mainstream political scientists, just comparing people's attitudes and preferences mm -hmm. with the votes of their own representatives. That's pretty straightforward. We see the votes, got plenty of polling data on the attitudes. For about 70% of the population, there's no correlation. They're totally unrepresented, the lower 70% on the income level. Yeah, you move up, you get a better correlation. You get to the top you know, fraction of 1%, they're basically setting policy, so perfect correlation. Well, people may not read political science journals, but they know this. Mm. They, they see it in front, right in front of their eyes. But then comes the role of activists. The demagogues are going to come in and say, yeah, this is because of the blacks, uh, the Puerto Ricans, the uh, immigrants, uh, you know, and so on. It's the job of activists to come say, no, it's not that. It's the job of the capitalist institutions made more savage and brutal by Thatcher, Reagan style neoliberalism. If you can get that across, then I think this gap you're describing will be overcome. Mm. It's a hard organizing job. You're running up against a ton of propaganda. Take, say, England. I don't have to tell you it's bringing coals to Newcastle, you know, much more than I do. But you know about the intense campaign of the media, the Parliamentary Labour Party, uh, do anything just to destroy uh, the effort to build a uh, participatory party in which people will be under control of it. It's pretty clear that the Blairite parliamentary uh, Labour Party was much preferred to lose the election than to lose the party. And we see the same thing in the United States. The Democratic National Committee would prefer to lose the election than to lose the party to the uh, young progressive wing, which is, if not the majority now, the coming majority. Well, the, and of course, the media is the same, media are the same pretty much across the spectrum. I mean, th that leads me to, because I, I kind of, I, I, I felt like there's thousands of us who lived that experience of seeing Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, the People's Assembly is across the left spectrum. It's not affiliated to one political party, but there was hope in Jeremy Corbyn from lots of sections of the left. And that opportunity has now gone to have the one of the most progressive prime ministers that we have ever seen in the United Kingdom that has gone. And lots of people are asking this question. It was one that was sent in. Should we spend any more time chasing a parliamentary root socialism in your view? Well, the traditional view of the left, which I think is valid, is that what matters is constant activism. Not just when an election comes up, but all the time. Now, every once in a while, an event comes along called an election. Uh, that should lead to a few minutes thought. Uh, does it matter which one wins? If it doesn't, do something else. If it does, take off a few minutes, push a lever, go back to work. Now, in England, one of the things you can do in your activism is create uh, an authentic, uh, popularly supported participatory party. Now, that was being done under Corbyn. It was killed off by the, you know, the top brass in the party. A variety, a variety of sections. <laughs> Come back. So that's part of activism. 
another part is just the constant pressure on whoever's in office to get them to do things. Uh, so I think it's not a choice, either parliamentary politics or activism, it's both mm. uh, balanced depending on the nature of the circumstances. Mm. And, and on, on the People's Assembly, because we are a grassroots movement combining large sections of the left, born of anti-austerity politics, essentially, and we want to grow even more people in to our movement and pull people in who have until now been politically apathetic. I want to know what in your view pulls people into the struggle, into resistance, in anti-capitalist thinking. What makes that flip for people? There are, in the United States, about half the population doesn't vote. There have been some studies of the uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, character of non-voters in the United States turns out to be very similar to the socioeconomic profile of people in Europe who vote for one of the laborite or social democratic parties. Uh, in the United States, they don't see anybody to vote for, so they stay home. I, think. I don't think it's very different in England. If there's a party that actually represents people, in which they participate, not just some bureaucrat up there says, here's the program, you, you push the button, but in which they participate locally, local activities, uh, things that are required in the community, and build up from there, become a party, then people will vote. Uh, otherwise, why should they? Mm. But, but what what about getting that because it's, it's become a bit of a like an obsession of a few of us who uh, know that there are many working class people who are in those deep experiences of poverty and uncertainty and like Boris Johnson for example and what 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 I suppose the fundamental question is what changes a person's mind to pull them into that resistance and anti-capitalist thinking well, is that your dog you don't mind yeah I've got a little company that's lovely it's fine they're well, welcome one of the is working at home <laughs> uh, so take my childhood mm. okay, early 30s it's very similar very deep depression. Things were pretty awful, much worse than now. Uh, the labor movement in the United States had been crushed in the 1920s. Had been a very vibrant militant movement. It was destroyed by its state and corporate power. Finally, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare meant basically wiped it out. Uh, in the early, when the depression hit in 1929, for working people, it just looked hopeless. Well, something happened. It took about five years, much too long, but the union started rebuilding, CIO began to organize, uh, political parties began to emerge from the left, a lot of activism, and pretty soon militant labor actions were taking place by 1935, 1936. Uh, they had reached the level of sit-down strikes. Now, a sit-down strike is very frightening to the to the bosses because that means we are one minute away from the people in the workforce saying we don't need you, get lost, we'll take over the, the, the enterprise and run it ourselves, as in fact they can do better than the managers. So at that point, they started getting saying a willingness on the part of the ownership class to make some adjustments. There was a sympathetic administration by then, made a big difference. And it was possible to move towards uh, basically welfare states. Stop it. Welfare state, social democracy, okay, the New Deal, which made a huge difference. And it can happen again. But it, it started on the ground, organizing activism, uh, militant actions when they were necessary, educational groups. Uh, the labor unions used to be uh, cultural educational organizations. Uh, you went, my, my, as I said before we started, my family was 
extended family was mostly first generation working class. But for them, the unions were their lives. Uh, that's where they went for uh, educational activities, cultural activities, concert, uh, party, uh, yeah. uh, even a, a week in the mountain, in the mountain was given by the union. So they couldn't they didn't have jobs, but they had a life, yeah. a rich life, which made them able to participate in the society, help create a new society. Now that's what has to be done. Now it has to be done on the ground, everywhere, locally, uh, starting in, you know, maybe starting with electing a school board and on and there from anything has to be done up to the national, in fact, I should say international level. This has to be done internationally. Uh, there's a reason why every union is called an international. Uh, maybe they're not living up to that, but there's a reason behind it. This is an international effort. Sometimes it's realized. So like when longshoremen in California refused to load ships going to apartheid South Africa, okay, mm. that's uh, internationalism. And it can go well beyond that, and it must. And in fact, right now, there's a interesting framework being developed, which might carry it forward. Uh, about a week ago, there was the first announcement of the Progressive International. Uh, it's initiated by Sanders in the United States, uh, Yanis Varoufakis in Europe, the M25 movement, Europe-wide movement. Uh, they're having their first official conference in September in Iceland, where the prime minister is one of the leading figures in it. Uh, it's an effort to create a true international aimed at reversing, overcoming the uh, neoliberal assault and moving on from there to a much more participatory, free, democratic, just world. Many ways to do that. They're bringing in the global south as representatives from India, Africa and elsewhere. Uh, this is an effort to counter a reactionary international which is being forged in Washington. Uh, the one geostrategic plan that you can see emerging from the chaos of the Trump administration is uh, exactly this to create an international of the most reactionary states in the world, guided by the White House, including uh, uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil, uh, uh, Sisi's Egypt, uh, the Gulf dictatorships, uh, Israel, which is going way to the right, and is a natural part of it, uh, Modi in India, uh, Orban in Hungary, uh, uh, Farage in England, uh, sometimes Johnson. Uh, we to try to put this together into a, a deeply reactionary international. Well, the progressive international will counter it. Now, if you look at the level of states, it looks totally unequal. If you look at the level of people, it's quite a different story. But that's where people like you come in. That can tip the balance. And which of these forces prevails will determine what kind of world comes out. And if uh, if only people could kind of realize a that stark choice, but b that power that they have that they can determine the future sustainability of the planet, the wages of their loved ones, the security of their homes, of the spe every species on the planet that will have a future. And I suppose. Um, it's about how do we communicate that people have that power to the broadest, uh, the broadest possible amount of people uh, to join in the in, in the struggle and in and in the fight. And I want to I want to end on this really, Noam, is that you have been campaigning and writing and thinking and being an activist for a long time now, and I want to know I want to know first the name of your dog. <laughs> What's your dog's name? Two of them, us and Philly. Oh, nice. Uh, but, but I also want to know, um, what inspires you to be hopeful? What, what has kept you uh, determined all of this time? What hope is there for people? Uh, truth is, it's people like you. 
<laughs> uh, people who are on the front lines, don't give up, keep working. There's reverses, there's progress. You move forward over, if you look over a long stretch, there's a good deal of progress. Mm -hmm. Our societies are much more civilized than they were not very long ago. I think say England, it wasn't that long ago when England uh, murdered a war hero, uh, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, because he was a homosexual. Okay. Uh, in fact, just, it was just a year or two ago that he finally got a royal pardon. Well, that's one of many signs of things that have changed a lot. You take a look at the United States uh, in the 1960s. That the United States had racist laws that were so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them as a model, literally. Anti-miscegenation laws of one drop of blood, you know. It's not perfect now, I just quoted Azar, but uh, it's a lot different from then. Mm -hmm. uh, you go back to the 1960s, British common law still held in the United States. According to British common law, Blackstone, women aren't people, they're property. The property of the father handed over to the husband. It wasn't until 1975 that the Supreme Court overruled that. But none of the, and it goes on, none of these things were gifts from above. They came from constant, hard, often bitter, dangerous struggle. And it's made changes, okay? And there are plenty of young people doing it right now. So take again the United States, what would the major issue we face, actually there's two major issues we face, one of them is even talked about, nuclear war, it's shocking that people aren't talking about it. So today, for example, uh, today Trump uh, dismantled uh, the one of the last uh, arms control agreements, the Open Skies Treaty, goes back to Eisenhower, it tells you how far right the political class has moved, uh, that dismantled the, the last one, okay, but, but the main, main one is climate change. It's inexorable, it's going to be a disaster, and we have maybe a decade or two to deal with it. If we don't, we're toast, okay? It's changing. Uh, say some form of Green New Deal is essential for survival. A couple of years ago, it was even not mentioned, uh, ridiculed, but now it's on the center of the legislative agenda in Congress. Why? A uh, group of young people, uh, Sunrise Movement, who are part of the much broader environmental movement, very broad, mostly young people, Extinction Rebellion and others. Now this group uh, was very active. They got to the point of taking over congressional offices uh, they were then supported by some of the young uh, congressional representatives who were swept in on the Sanders wave, uh, especially Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mm -hmm. uh, backed them, uh, picked up a senator from Massachusetts, Ed Markey, is now on the center of the legislative agenda. You can do something with it. If you take a look at the Democratic uh, program, Biden's program, uh, it's farther to the left than any democratic program since Roosevelt. Not because Biden and the Democratic National Committee had a conversion, but because of the constant pounding on the door of people, mostly young people, uh, people like you, people like the Sunrise Movement, who made them do it. That can continue. Well, that's a good enough reason for hope. I, I very much agree with you and I, I don't think any of us would um, go out there and take part in demonstrations put ourselves up for elected office join in people assembly local meetings if we didn't believe in the potential for change and every single thing that you have listed there as you quite rightly said came from human struggle from collectivization and i think if anything this virus has 
connected our countries and I don't just mean the USA and the United Kingdom I mean connected all of our countries in that in that common struggle of knowing that other other countries uh, are, are dealing with intense physical and political crises and failure in political leadership and hopefully, and, and you mentioned one there, hopefully new bonds will be forged out of this crisis that will allow us to transform the economic system and, and, and cultural norms, essentially, about what we will endure on this planet, what we will endure in our lives. And I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Noam. I, uh, you know, you, you, you the things that you have contributed is is overwhelming. And I suppose just wanted to give you one last opportunity to say anything uh, without the confines of the questions that I put, anything at all that you just wish people would realize or want people to know. Well, I think there's one good thing to keep in mind. I get a flood of letters from young people who are just in despair. Uh, we've, we haven't achieved everything, anything gets beaten back, uh, what can we do? Uh, you have to remember that uh, you basically have two choices. Uh, you can decide to be pessimistic, hopeless, uh, let the worst come, you'll contribute to that. Or you can recognize there are opportunities, uh, there are people who have grasped them under much harsher conditions than we face. And they have moved things forward. So whatever the probability may be, the choice is either sit back in a corner and let the worst happen, grab the opportunities, you can make it a better world. It's not much of a choice. And on that note, I will say thank you so much to you uh, for everything. And I have to say your just typing your name into YouTube has made the lockdown experience uh, at times enjoyable. You know, you have so much content out there. I'd recommend anyone that hasn't come across Noam's work to just do that, type his name into YouTube and see the millions upon millions of views for his lectures, his interviews, his contributions. Uh, thanks for supporting the people's assembly we are a broad-based activist group that will not give up until there is a better world and honestly just thanks so much the future is in your hands <laughs> glad to be with you thank you